Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I see some people are joining, but we can uh, they can catch up, I guess. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on the evolution of travel demand forecasting, new paradigms and technologies. My name is Janelle Hansen. I'm a senior transportation planner here at Systematica, and I'll be moderating today's session. I'd like to introduce our presenters. We're being joined by Eduardo Espita, transpor uh, transportation consultant at Systematica, Lita Hunsinger, uh, she's Director of Research Systems Planning and Analysis from ITRI, Kyle Ward from Caliper, and Luis Williamson, a managing partner from Nom Nom. Kyle will be filling in today for his colleague, Vince Bernardin, who's unfortunately unable to join us today. So, oh, let me switch. So the focus of our webinar is that transportation modeling has always played a decisive role in supporting the decision-making process, providing evidence-based analysis and a robust technical response to planning transportation infrastructure. This has been gaining importance as cities and mobility requirements have evolved rapidly and the increase of new technologies is triggering a shift in transportation modes. In this session, we question how can transportation modeling respond to the rapid changes our cities are going through and how can we take full advantage of the evolving data collection technologies and continuously update and revisit the modeling approaches and techniques? So our aim is that this talk provides some insights on how travel demand modeling is evolving and what modelers, practitioners, and researchers will be asked in the coming years for making the process faster, effective, and dynamic. So our agenda for today is as follows. As I wrap up the introduction, we'll have our speaker's presentation and then time for questions and discussion at the end. Uh, during the discussion time, we'd love to hear from you. Our Zoom session is actually set to meeting mode. So you can ask questions and you can have your video cameras on so we can engage with you. I ask because it is in meeting mode that you try to keep your, your mic on mute so we don't hear the, the background noise, but feel free to turn your cameras on. It'd be great to see people out there and uh, engaged. Uh, a recorded version of this webinar will be available within a few days uh, following the webinar today. So if you're unable to catch everything, we will send it out to you if you if you registered on that link. So for those of you just joining us, welcome. And let's go ahead and jump into the, the presentations with Eduardo. Thank you, Janelle. I will share my screen. First of all, thanks to everybody who has joined us today. Um, we'll be showing you very briefly an application on the use of new data sources, such as big data, floating car data, and mobile network data, uh, to approach strategic transport modeling. And the case study is the Sustainable Urban Mobility Plan of Venice. As probably all of you know, this is a strategic tool that has been developed in many cities to try to plan for a better future in the mobility of our cities, more um, accessible cities, a more equitable cities, and more sustainable transport systems. And of course, within this plan, it is very important to analyze which uh, modifications to the system uh, would be more beneficial to the, to the city and which effects could we expect from certain interventions. So uh, we were going to develop the multimodal transport model for the city of Venice. And it has been uh, very interesting to work in such a special city, such a special and different city. One could say that Venice could be divided in different types of city or different city centers. On the right, you see the image of the Venice that probably most of people know, which is the historic center located at the main island of the Venetian Lagoon. And this is the city for not only for tourism, but also for residents. And within this part of the city, cars are not allowed and people either walk or use boats to move within the island. And there's another part of the city in the dry land, which is actually where most of the people live. And year after year, people are moving out from the islands into the dry land. So the interaction and this accessibility um, between those areas is very important and is the main focus of the Sustainable Urban Mobility Plan. The, basically, the connection between the dry land and the main island of the Venetian Lagoon relies only on one single connection, which is the bridge um, Ponte della Libertà. And along that bridge, only in the single uh, uh, peak hour of the morning period, we have more than 10,000 trips per hour per direction. 
Most of that trips uh, take place uh, using public transportation, either a rail or bus or tramway, uh, but also about 2,000 vehicles arrive to the main island by car every, uh, every hour in the morning peak. So when we start to work on the model, we approached it looking at traditional data, the ISTAT, which is the National Institute of Statistics of Italy. Uh, they carried out a massive travel survey in 2011, and they basically provided a database with uh, very detailed data, not only about the number of trips, but also about the mode in which those trips were made at the time. Uh, but since mobility is changing and um, people are moving out from the islands into the, the dry land, we wanted to look at more recent data, but were also uh, time constrained. So we looked at new data sources, in this case, floating car data and mobile phone data. And we integrated this information and we analyzed different sources to create a prior audio metrics that was later calibrated through maybe traditional um, um, data, which are traffic counts, passenger uh, counts and interviews. When we look at the data from the floating car data matrix, we, we, we can analyze first in the dry land relations are quite sensible compared to what the travel survey 10 years ago uh, was showing. But uh, uh, when we look at what happens with the main island and the connection between the dry land and the main island, although more than 2,000 uh, trips take, take place by car in one hour, there is an underestimation of trips, not only in terms of quantity, but also in terms of all pairs. So it was not representative of the mobility patterns between the dry land and the main island. And of course, we could analyze um, the trips between different islands with floating car data. So we looked at different sources, in this case, mobile phone data. And in this case, we see from the desired lines that the main island of the Venetian Lagoon, which is located here, is actually um, a, a big generator and attractor of trips. Uh, and it's not only within, uh, within the peak hour, but also throughout the day because of the presence of, the, of tourists. And um, when we look at the, a big data from mobile phones, we can see not only uh, trips within the peak hour, we can also look at a wider picture. So we can look at how a mobility pattern changed throughout the day, not only in terms of how many trips are done, but also on how long those trips are done and who, uh, uh, who is doing those trips. Because when analyzing mobile data, um, we can also have a preliminary segmentation of the demand, looking at where people live, how many of those trips were registered within the observation period. If that trip is registered more than three times within the same week, is something that you do usually to go to work or to go to study. And you can also analyze how many of these trips are coming from, um, from another country. So you can analyze also um, the variations of tourism during the summer, during winter, so you can have a wider picture of the mobility patterns. And maybe it's not using the model because if you analyze maybe just one single hour, but it's useful for planning. And it's useful also to expand and to extend the results from the draft model into a wider period. Um, although those, those um, data sources are very interesting to use and are relatively fast um, to receive the data and you can look at different years and look different time periods, it is also important to integrate and combine this data with traditional methods. And uh, we're talking about automatic traffic counts, we're talking about interviews, about um, video camera, video recordings, because it's important to calibrate and validate the data that we obtain from the matrices with real data, with observable data. For example, um, in the case of Venice, when we look at the main island, it is quite interesting because we are able actually to count how many people is arriving to the island because there's only basically only one access point. So we are able only, we are, we are able also to calibrate the, the matrix uh, of external trips based on observations. So it's quite important to, to also combine data with, with, with other methods. And the idea was uh, in, in, in this model was to analyze not only what was happening in the dry land and to analyze um, the, the main trip, let's say from other cities to, to Venice, done by car or by public transportation, but it was also important for us to analyze uh, the combination of different transport modes that take place in Venice. People arriving by, by car or, or train or bus or tram to the main island, then they have to move 
um, until the final destination and they have to choose whether uh, to take the boat or to walk or a combination of both. And that was important because one of the purposes of the, of the mobility plan was also to analyze other possibilities in order to release the pressure on that access point and to have other possibilities to access the islands from different points of the city. So to do that, um, it was very useful to analyze the data from mobile phone because it allowed us to have more detailed information about destinations and combining that with the census data and with the tra um, national travel survey, we were allowed to have quite a disaggregated uh, assignment model for the main island of the lagoon. So we, are, we were estimated how people arrive, car or train or other mode of public transport, and then people may leave their car in the, um, the park and ride facilities or they leave the station and then they decide to take the public transportation within the island or to move to another island um, by public transportation and then the last part of their path legs by walking. Um, so I think this is a, a good example of how uh, different data sources can be combined uh, in order to have um, a realistic model that can give you some idea of what could happen if different access points are located in different parts of the city and how you can release the pressure on access point and how you can improve accessibility um, of the different um, islands and how you can how can you connect the different islands um, among them. So um, that's that's it from my side. Um, if you have any question at the end of the webinar, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, thanks, Eduardo. Nice presentation. So next we're gonna have Lita. Lita, I think you have controls over, yep. And we can see you just started sharing. Yep, we can see the screen. And you're still on mute, so. All right, yeah, yep. I muted, needed to unmute. So um, thank you for confirming you can see my slides. Uh, hello everybody, and thank you to Janelle and Systematica for the invitation to speak here today. Um, my presentation may be a little different from the others that you're going to hear because um, rather than speaking to the technical components of our model, which uh, Kyle Ward will do next, I want to give a presentation that's more from a practitioner's perspective on the evolution of travel models um, through the lens of our experience here in the Research Triangle region of North Carolina. Um, I saw some familiar names uh, on the call. So I know some of you know our region, but for those of you who don't, I thought I would give a little bit of an overview. Um, we believe that the Research Triangle region is unique and special in a lot of ways. Um, one of those is that rather than having a strong urban center, uh, we actually have several strong cities with varied and sometimes competing economies, um, which can present somewhat of a challenge at times. Uh, transportation planning in our region is covered by two metropolitan planning organizations, the Durham Chapel Hill Carborough MPO that's to the west of our region and the Capital Area MPO that's to the east. At the heart of our region uh, is the Raleigh-Durham International Airport, as well as Research Triangle Park, uh, the largest research park in the United States. We get our name, the Triangle Region, from three tier one research uh, universities, North Carolina State, Duke University, and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. These three universities form something of a triangle um, and are separated by only eight miles at the shortest distance and then only 25 miles at the longest distance. Our economy in the triangle is largely driven by technology and biotech industries. We're also home to uh, the state government for North Carolina and we have a very affluent and highly educated population. Like many other regions, our demographics are changing. Um, our population is aging, but what we're seeing from our travel survey data is that that aging uh, cohort is actually traveling more than they did in the past. Our household size is actually getting smaller. We've seen an increase in single and two person households with no children. We're also seeing an increase in the number of zero car households, which I think is really notable for a region like ours, which is 
um, still very auto or car dependent. And then finally, we are starting to see some emerging development patterns with an increased interest in mixed use development uh, and higher uh, densities. So our historic development patterns have created um, several challenges that we must deal with. Um, even though we are seeing some development patterns that are emerging that, that focus on that mixed use um, and that density, we're still a very sprawling region. And a lot of the forecast uh, growth is expected to have a more outward pattern. And then I already mentioned some of those other challenges, no central city, and then the fact that, that we've got really large trip attractors uh, located at the center of our region, which is actually the intersection of the two um, MPOs. Along with these challenges and try to, to try to address those challenges, we've identified different goals um, to try and create through transportation planning the kind of region that we all want to live with. And then I think as most of you on the call know that the, the travel modeling tools um, are the key analytical tools for help, helping to guide that process. So travel modeling and analytics for our region are, is supported by four key stakeholders. I already mentioned the two MPOs. We also have a regional transit agency called Go Triangle, and of course, our Department of Transportation. Uh, but the actual modeling work for this region is conducted by a modeling service bureau uh, that's housed at a Transportation Research Institute on the campus of NC State. Uh, this structure was designed to create an unbiased team of professionals uh, to support the modeling work for the region. Um, and that team is made up by professional staff at the Institute, as well as um, staff from our member agencies that spend at least a half of their time helping to support this work. Our current uh, travel model can be described as an advanced trip-based model. We do have logic models for generation, distribution, and mode choice. We also have a non-binary or a non-motorized binary split model, and then several special market models, including uh, an airport model and a university trip model. As you can imagine, university trips are a very important travel market in our region. But we're not without challenges and constraints. Um, I would say that primarily among these is the fact that um, our current official model was estimated using survey data from 2006. Now, for many regions, that may not be a concern, but for a region like ours that's seen the growth and change that our region has, there's kind of this feeling of uneasiness that we might be missing something important. Another challenge for us is that the code base for the model is outdated and, and really not well designed. And so that in and of itself creates significant runtime issues. And it also impedes the ability of model users to really understand what's going on under the hood just because of how the, the code has been you know, sort of put together um, over the years. Uh, I think that stems from the fact that that a lot of some or some of the code, I should say, is from the original triangle regional model that was actually developed um, in, the, in the late, late 90s. So as new model elements were introduced, you know, rather than having them fully specified and integrated as a full system, they were sort of uh, you know, piecemealed in. And um, some of us in the region like to, to call this our one piece at a time Cadillac. Uh, for those of you who may be familiar um, with a song that was sung by the late Johnny Cash. And if you've not heard that, I encourage you to, you know, go to YouTube and, and take a look. Um, that, that, that would be what we sometimes joke as our model. Um, so, but you know, not, not such a bad world, I guess. Not, not an ideal situation, but it's, it seemed to work. Um, you might say that we've been comfortably hanging out in the shallow water uh, for some time. Um, but as we've come to realize, there's, there's a danger, uh, you know, hanging out in the shallow, shallow water doesn't always um, equate to being safe. Uh, as our region has started moving towards more diverse transportation projects and policies, uh, and the demands on our model by our consulting community that supports a lot of the planning and analysis work that's done in our region, it really became increasingly clear to us that we needed a new framework. 
Now, there's several reasons why any of you may want to think about evolving your trip-based model, but in our case, um, we realized, I think, first and foremost, that we started a recurring household travel survey effort back in 2016. And all of that new rich data really provides us with an opportunity to update our model, and not just a piecemeal, but a full re-specification. There was also a feeling that with the, the growing demands in our area that we weren't fully meeting our analytical or planning needs. Um, the model was felt to be inefficient and difficult to use in application. And then we also recognized that there are a lot of advances out there um, that we really weren't taking advantage of. So once you've made a decision to evolve your trip-based model, it doesn't always mean that you know exactly how to do that or what you want to do, um, or at least that was the case with us. We talked for some time about an activity-based model, um, which seemed like a log logical choice. But I will say that there were many in our region that were reluctant to take that leap. And so we did need to consider a different path for various reasons. Some of those just concerns about data requirements, runtime requirements, I think staff constraints, and so forth. Um, as we began to talk to experts in the field, we came to realize that you know, there's not just uh, one big fish in the sea, but there's actually a lot of different fish in the sea, or maybe another way to say there's a lot of different options for how you might evolve your travel model. And I think you're, you all are hearing some of that in this webinar today. Um, so for us, what we decided to do was um, to really take a stepped approach, which allows us to introduce many advanced elements with the initial specification, but to develop somewhat of an, an agile structure that, uh, that lays a path for uh, introducing additional elements at a later date. Um, so we are headed down this path to overcome the challenges of our existing model, but we also hope that we're gonna um, recognize a lot of other benefits. For example, improved decision-making and the ability to answer more questions, a better understanding of the answers that come out of the model, because really that's, that's the key to these models is to inform the work that we need to do uh, to better leverage uh, passive data, as Eduardo just talked about, some of the benefits of, of data like that. And then for us personally, I think just where we are in our decision making, recognizing that this stepped approach really does minimize the risk for us, and it reduces the upfront time and cost that we needed uh, for the initial specification of our model. And so next up, Kyle Ward is gonna um, cover a little more details on what that technical specification looks like for what we're calling our generation two model here in the triangle. Great, thanks, thanks Lita. I'll give you a, a virtual, virtual clap so you're not uh, <laughs> thinking you're alone out here. Thank you for presenting. Thank you. Okay. Can you see my uh, screen? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. All right. Um, so I am not uh, Vince Bernard, um, but uh, he and I are working with Lita on their TRM G2, and uh, they have asked me to fill in for him uh, today. So I will do my best uh, to cover his slides. At least for a number of them, we've been working together on it. So hopefully I can talk to it uh, semi-intelligently. Uh, here's the box quote that Vince loves. Um, I'm pretty sure it's in every one of his uh, presentations, but you know, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, so that's just how he generally likes to uh, start off any presentation. Um, so how do you stay useful? I'm talking about the evolution of models, um, so this slide for him is, you know, how do you manage these evolving streams of passive data uh, with limited funds? And there's also changes in travel, you know, the Ubers and Lyfts and TNCs, uh, and a growing uh, desire to address equity and things like that. <clears throat> so um, if Lita called the existing model the uh, one piece at a time Cadillac, I think uh, Vince is playing off of that with the 
I don't know, 1950s World Fair era picture of you know self-driving cars and playing playing games. Um, so this is um, the evolution of travel model architectures. Um, so down at the bottom, we have you know, the, the classic aggregate four step. Uh, in the middle, there's, there's a hybrid model. Uh, at the disaggregate, he has activity-based models and agent-based models. Um, right now, he's put this uh, person-based model uh, in the mixed category. I think that's probably largely because the TRM G2 model is a hybrid model. Uh, but um, actually, you know, a, a person, what we're going to talk about today uh, could easily go fully disaggregate um, and capture many of the benefits, but not all of, you know, activity or, or tour-based models. And down here at the bottom, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to bring in some of the ML stack uh, to improve some of our predictive power in these person-based models, and we'll, we'll show that in a minute. All right, so person-based models or, or PBMs, uh, it's kind of three main emphasis uh, areas. So uh, boundedly rational persons, so uh, and, you know, diverse, so that it's not a synthetic population of clones, different people make, so that not only do they make different decisions, but they also make decisions differently. Like a, an obvious example is some people think about their mode first and their destination. Some people might think about their destination and then their mode. Uh, so yeah, so you have these heterogeneous choice structures um, and hopefully some, you know, using some new econometric theory to address those. Uh, an emphasis on big data. So, you know, multiple diverse data sources, um, panel data, um, LBS data, all that good stuff. And then um, trying to bring in, you know, machine learning and, and AI, but uh, to head off that common criticism that they're black boxes and to try to keep them explainable. So they do offer some powerful non-parametric methods, uh, but that, as you'll see, uh, very intuitive and, and easy for people to, to understand how they're working, if done right. So the first set, uh, you know, rational persons. So uh, this is um, uh, the choice structure uh, for the, the TRM G2. At least uh, this is something that we may build towards. So um, the idea here is that you know, not everyone is actually trading off every choice every day. Um, if people, you know, make long-term choices about where to live and how many cars to own, um, you know, they may not, even if you ran a new bus line out to their house, they've already made an investment, you know, they, they already have the car, they'll likely use it. So you have this idea of, you know, the, the auto class. Um, most people know about the, you know, transit captive or transit class, people who don't own cars, they may be low income, uh, they're not really impacted by changes to you know, auto level of service, but they're more dependent on transit changes. And then there are these people in the middle uh, who actually do, maybe they're auto insufficient households, for example, and they do need to balance multiple people in their household and, and make different choices, um, perhaps even daily, but, you know, certainly about commuting patterns and things like that. And, and they see, you know, all the different modes that we normally think about. Uh, both transit, non-auto, and, and non or auto and non-motorized. So this is uh, this is an idea about how we might do this. And one of the research topics that we're going to uh, pursue is to see if we can't estimate a latent class. Uh, so a latent class model is something where uh, you know no one actually tells you in the household survey that oh I'm an auto class no matter what and I'm, I'm auto captive. So it's trying to tease that out of the survey data. So uh, not done yet, but we're, we're thinking about it. There's a couple of software packages uh, that could potentially do this. So um, you, talking here about kind of the, the problems with traditional choice models. Uh, so some the first bullet point, uh, you know, your, your IID GEV assumption. Um, for mode choice, right, like a taking bus or taking a car, those are very distinct choices. 
Uh, they, they look very different. They're easier to kind of choose between or to estimate a model. But if you have one destination on one side of the street and the other destination on the other side of the street, uh, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not quite so identical or you know, independently distributed. So if nothing else, you know, spatial autocorrelation. Um, so th these basically pr presents models, uh, presents problems for destination choice models in particular, um, but, but other choices uh, as, as well. So uh, what Vince lays out here is, you know, kind of a, a new econometric choice theory. Um, I won't go down into the details, but uh, what Vince is asserting here is that the, the GEV, um, you know, the, the Gumbel distribution of errors um, don't, don't necessarily, doesn't necessarily need to hold. So what he's, uh, what I'm going to try to show in these two slides is that he's, uh, we're thinking we're going to try to estimate this Wasserstein approach uh, that's been uh, a big deal in computer vision lately. Um, and, and maybe uh, that would give us an opportunity to improve this kind of these issues, particularly in destination choice, where distance away from the right answer is a relevant uh, metric that could potentially improve the model. So this Wasserstein distance, um, it's qualitatively, it's, it's really not uh, too difficult to understand, particularly if you've done like some ordered logit or something like that. This uh, this slide is trying to get at that. So um, the chart in blue is this like, you know, observed distribution of letters. Um, it's made up, but what we have are two different models, the orange and gray distribution one and distribution two. Um, and they are, you know, trying to predict or trying to match this observed distribution of letters. So actually the participant screen is uh, blocking the stats for me, but uh, the key thing is that the GEV log likelihood is the same for distribution one and distribution two. However, we know that you know these letters aren't IID and GEV. There, there's an there's an order to them. E is closer than F, is closer to F than H is. So what this is showing is that actually in distribution two, you know yes, it's over predicting uh, E. But better to overpredict E, which is near F, than to overpredict H, which is further away from F. So the idea is, is can we can we train some of these econometric models uh, to understand more, particularly in destination choice, about the, the spatial relationship and the autocorrelation, and and get close, even if you don't get the exact right zone out of you know a uh, a set of three thousand or more zones. So uh, the second piece, data-driven modeling. Uh, this is just an animation of you know, single day point data uh, from the Research Triangle Park. Um, this is something that you guys have probably seen a bunch. Uh, you know, Eduardo talked about that as well. So I'll basically just leave that there. Uh, the types of big data. So there's uh, three kind of big ones right now, cellular data, which is actually kind of falling out uh, due to various reasons. Um, app data on your smartphone and then vehicle probe data, um, predominantly for trucks. So down at the bottom, um, some, of the, some of the notes, you know, this idea of duration bias on cellular data is, which I'll, I'll show a chart in a second, but it's the idea that you, you're gonna miss short trips. Uh, so you're gonna probably skew towards longer trips. Um, the problem with app data is, you know, you can quickly think of large segments of the population who aren't going to be represented uh, if you don't have a smartphone for whatever reason, age or income status or anything like that, you know, you're not going to be in that data set. And uh, vehicle data, uh, great for trucks, really hit or miss for everything else. So uh, this idea of, of big data to the rescue. Um, so up top is the state of Tennessee, and the dots are showing you the um, households surveyed in three separate surveys. 
And actually, I forget the stats. I'm gonna see if I can move this to actually see. Okay. Uh, so the the combined household survey, you know, ten thousand house households, where on the right, what he's doing is giving you a measurement of you know, the sample size. So the the trip table, like the, the observed trips. The household survey is only giving you 0.3% of um, kind of the, the OD pairs. It's only filling in that much and giving you information and not even great information, but at least a little bit of information for some of those OD pairs. Whereas the AirSage data, which uh, depending on when this data was collected was either cell phone or um, LBS data, like uh, smartphone data um, is 26%. And the point, that is well made here is the, the difference between those percentages. It's, it's not a, a linear relationship. And he illustrates this by saying, you know, can you tell what this picture is with less than 2% of the pixels shown? Uh, you really don't know what that is, uh, but you don't need 100%, right? Uh, we start to getting around 25 to 30% of the pixels and you can now figure out uh, what this picture is ultimately going to look like. So uh, that's the point there about big data giving a much larger sample size and more importantly, enough of a sample size to actually feel confident in, uh, in the travel flows that you're seeing. Uh, this slide is a, a little bit about um, an ensemble approach that um, IDOT is using. So they at the top, they have you know, cur current travel patterns from big data. And uh, right now, they have their traditional local MPO models that produce a forecast. Uh, they also have, you know, for the same region, they can have a, um, an advanced trip-based model give them a forecast. And in the future, you could imagine that they build several models. So if you've ever seen like a, a hurricane tracker on the, on, you know, on the weather, uh, they have various models who give different trajectories of the storm and they're based on different assumptions and, um, you know, it gives you kind of a, um, an idea of the, the, the ways that the storm might travel. This ensemble approach might give us a little bit more variation in our predictions and a little bit more comfort with how strong we think a particular prediction is, if it's way out, if it really disagrees with all the rest or if it's kind of in line. Uh, limitations of big data, we mentioned some of them. Um, what's missing in big? So we talked about travelers, um, you know, seniors or low income or, or other people who just uh, may not be well represented. And then travel, there's coverage issues. Um, that's kind of a big deal. Uh, shorter trips and activities get missed. That's the duration bias. Um, and th there's some, some other things. Uh, so this is uh, Sand Dunes National Park in July. And the dots are basically pings uh, from, you know, from, from cell phones and smartphones. Um, but what's highlighted in red are these corridors where uh, there should be uh, at least sizable, at least noticeable traffic, but there's nothing there. And when you realize it's because Either there's no satellite coverage there, or there's some kind of tree covering, or there's no cell tower nearby to triangulate with. Uh, you you wind up with these gaps, um, and, and that's that's a that's a new problem that you know a household survey doesn't necessarily have. So we have to figure out what to do uh, with that. The other is this idea of um, you know that these aren't random samples of the population. So uh, you know this demographics of LBS data versus the census. Um, it shouldn't be surprising that, you know, higher income people are more likely to have the latest smartphone and the latest apps, right? So they get tracked a lot more often and they make up a larger population, a larger percent of the population compared to, you know, the actual total population of the census. Similar for age, it skews young. That, that should also not surprise anyone. Uh, so seniors would be underrepresented and the 25 to 34 cohort would be overrepresented. And this may change over time, right? I mean, the 25 to 34 year olds now are unlikely to put their smartphones away, you know, as they get older. Um, but at least for now, this is, this is a problem. 
And then finally, this is uh, duration. So smartphones uh, versus uh, the survey. So uh, what we can see is that uh, the, uh, the distribution uh, from the, oh, sorry, I'm trying to move too many pictures around. So we see this uh, underrepresentation of uh, long uh, of I'm sorry. Let me rephrase that. Um, an underrepresentation of short duration trips, uh, simply because you know, especially if you're only pinging a cell tower, you know, every five or ten minutes. Well, trips below five ten minutes are very unlikely to be captured or or less likely. Uh, whereas the longer trips. Um, you're more likely to ping towers or uh, otherwise communicate with the network and then and show up. So we have this duration bias. All right, and then the third area of emphasis for these person-based models, um, explainable artificial intelligence. So uh, this is something that um, uh, we developed for the triangle. And uh, in short, we, we tried to to rework their production model. Um, and we used uh, this aggregate model at the person level, hence the, you know, the name person-based model. So we could use attributes of the individual person to make these uh, trip rate predictions. Uh, we did uh, logistic regression. We did uh, GLMs. Uh, we did various different things. Um, but we're really happy with the fit uh, for, for any of them. Uh, so. Uh, Long story short, after trying you know, full AI models, which are hard to understand, what we actually wound up with is this kind of machine learning. Uh, it, it's a guided process, which helps us understand the structure of our data, but which is really understandable. And this idea on the right is that through a series of questions, if you've ever played 20 questions with a kid or when you were a kid, um, you can ask these questions and what the ML is doing for us is not making the guess for us, but showing us the structure of the data that leads to really distinct differences in trip rates. So on the right, this is you know, the home-based work trip. And you can see that at the top, uh, for the entire population that first node, the trip rate is 0.45. Um, but as you ask these questions, if you're not a worker, um, let's see, if you're not a worker, you make effectively no work trips. Um, if you're if you are a worker, now your trip rate jumps to 0.88. But if you're young, right, you know you're only making 0.33. And if you're above 19, you're making this. And you can see how each question asked ends up with these bottom nodes of the tree, which lead to very distinct rates in trip making. And the variables that are uh, so this is the machine coming up with these breakpoints. But we can look at them and look at these age breakdowns and realize that actually these make intuitive sense. Um, it's using ANOVA. It's using information gain. Um, we're not telling it where these age breakpoints are. But when we see that a tree that looks like this, it's very intuitive to us. We can understand what's driving uh, behavior. We're also doing some non-home-based, um, making some non-home-based changes. Uh, this is something that Lita and I had actually come uh, to, at least in part, um, several years back. Uh, Vince had been working on it at the same time, but had taken it a few steps further. But the basic idea is you do everything from the home-based trips first. You choose their modes, their uh, destinations, all that kind of stuff. And then once you know that, then your non-home-based models become conditional on those home-based trip ins. So, if um, in, a, in a very traditional model, the non-home-based trips just kind of go all over the place. Anywhere there's employment, you're gonna have non-home-based trips. But the easiest way to think about this is if you don't have any home-based trips to a zone, um, you're going to have no non-home-based. Um, and also it's by mode. So if all of the travel to a particular zone from home is auto, uh, you'll get a different share of modes compared to if all the travel was transit. So for instance, if everyone coming to a zone was transit, the only non-home-based trips that would come out of that zone would either be transit or walk or something like that. So we condition the non-home-based process on home-based, which gives us a much more accurate uh, forecast, particularly for places 
uh, like, like downtown. Um, let's see. Uh, this one I'll, I'll quickly go over, but it's the idea that these non-home-based generation models uh, were again pulling from ML, this idea of boosting. So uh, in black in this equation, you have basically just like a simple regression from home-based trip ins, predicting how many non-home-based trip reductions you'll have. But this idea that we would boost this model um, with accessibility, and the easiest way to understand that is actually not the math, but it's with this final chart here. So we have our initial estimates of what the trip making is for non-home based. But when we look at how that um, relates to accessibility, we see these adjustment factors. So as an example, um, these are our walk trips. Uh, I, I won't explain all the different trip types, but the, the general trend here is that as walk accessibility drops, uh, we're going to lower below one. So a factor below one means we're going to reduce the number of uh, non-home based walk trips that are generated. And if you're in a downtown area, you'll see an increase in the number. And that's uh, in addition to what our simple uh, linear regression model would predict. So it gives us a little bit more sensitivity to development patterns and accessibility. Uh, post processors, this one I'll, I'll just cover real quick, but it's the idea that um, these person level models, we might be able to back in to uh, diaries. So after we have our aggregate um, traffic assignment and OD matrices, we could then synthesize back to complete diaries. Uh, this is something that we're, we're thinking about, uh, could be useful for measuring uh, certain things about equity. Um, and then lastly, this idea of accessibility. Um, Transcad uh, Caliper software has a lot of different GIS tools focused on accessibility because it's a it's a growing concern. Uh, this is you know the obvious like isochrome uh, drive time bands, but there's also accessibility to employment and and things like that. And so that's helping people make decisions. These great new models that we're building, if you can't use them to easily easily visualize outputs and make decisions, they're they're not really worth much. So. Uh, that's an, another big focus of, of what we're doing in the triangle. Um, and here's Vince's contact information. Uh, my email is shocker, just Kyle at caliper.com as opposed to Vince at caliper.com. Um, so yeah, I'm hanging around and we'll, we'll answer any questions um, after we're all wrapped up. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. I'll give you also a, a virtual applause. <laughs> thank you, and thank you. Kyle was very nice enough to, to fill in for Vince, who unfortunately couldn't make it, so he got warning today to fill in. So I think we all deserve to give Kyle a round of applause for jumping in and uh, filling in for, for Vince's very technical slides. I know you're also a very technical person, but, but uh, Vince really packed in a lot of information on the slides. So thank you very much for, for filling in for, for Vince. Yep, thanks for having me. Yep. So we're going to hand it over now to Luis, who's going to present. Let's see if Luis is there. So it's all yours whenever you're ready, Luis. And I hope you're seeing my, my screen as well. Yes, we can see it. Good. Um, okay, my, my name is, is Louis Williams and I am a partner in uh, a company that does the big data sort of things. I mean, it would be a competitor of LSH if we were working in, in the US, but we are working mostly in Europe and, and Latin America. And um, I would like to thank you for inviting me to share my problems. And I think this is um, a problem shared is a problem half solved, and they say, and uh, I, I would certainly like to tell you where my, my biggest problems are at the moment. And, and the biggest problems are in the range of new mobility systems. Um, I can take some advantages from new data sources to try to handle these problems. But the key problem is that modeling the new mobility systems is, is very difficult, if you want to do it well. I, I consider that we, have, we are facing four, and only four, main challenges in our modeling field today. Um, the, and, and you have mentioned three of them, in fact, in the presentation before. One of them is 
is equity. The other one is sustainability or the environment. And that was the first presentation um, about Venice and uncertainty. And again, and this was mentioned uh, at the end of the presentation from, from, from Caliban. But I'm now going to deal with, with the fourth one, which is the new mobility systems that are turning up almost every day. And they pose challenges, which we are at the moment not very well placed to deal with them. Um, first of all, consider shared vehicles. And this is, we already have shared vehicles for a long while. Taxis have existed for probably as long as cars have existed. But more recently, we have different versions with Lyft, UberX. Uh, these are um, share vehicles uh, in a way, but you can also rent a car by the minute uh, locally or rent a bicycle by the minute or even rent an electric scooter by the minute. And these are new systems that we are not representing very well. In fact, traditionally, especially in places like the US and, and, and some big cities in Europe, we have not bothered to model taxis, because modeling taxis is actually difficult. And that's okay if taxis are a very small proportion of your traffic. But in places like London, London has been modeling taxis for, for some time now, because a taxi is a very important mode of trans public transport uh, in, in London. And so is the case in, for example, in, in Lima, or in, in Bogota, in Medellin, in, in, in Vietnam. Several places in the world have a very high proportion of these uh, very cheap taxis operating in them. And only now we're starting to model them. And then you, you have the ride sharing services. This is a case in which you share a ride with other customers. Uh, it's also called demand responsive transport, although the, the taxis are also demand responsive. Uh, and the Uber pool is a, probably the most typical example and as we know, mobility as a service is, is a generic name for it, and it's now evolving towards a multimodal uh, offer. You, with one app and one request, you can get a multimodal journey from end to end and track it, pay it for it, and qualify it, and give, give a number of stars with the service as well. And another type of service that is increasing recently as a result of the pandemic, very much so, is a multi-point delivery service, the Amazon-like service. Um, and again, these, these are new. These are very difficult to model with a conventional system. Certainly a trip-based system is, is sort of fails there. And we also have the, the, the sort of sexy new technologies, the Hyperloop, the air taxis, and the connected and auto automated vehicles. I mean, what do we do with them? How do we represent them in our models? And the challenges are because in principle, if it's just a simple public transport service like Hyperloop or a cable car, which is another mode of that kind, which is new, uh, very popular in Medellin, for example. Um, if they are fixed route and fixed frequency schedule, we can model them in the traditional way in our models. And it's a public transport mode. But when you go to a demand responsive mode, this becomes a much more difficult thing. First of all, you have to estimate what level of service they are delivering. Because the level of service they deliver is what will determine the attractiveness, how many people will be attracted to use them. And the level of service is defined by the access time to the system, which could be zero if you summon a taxi at your front door. Waiting time, this is never actually zero. You are in vehicle time, and in the case of ride sharing, diversion times, your, your route is not going to be the shortest route from A to B. You're going to stop to pick up other passengers and diversions in this route and stops, additional stops in the route will happen. And this will be part of the level of service that you're getting. Potentially, you may also have dynamic pricing, surge pricing as Uber does. And that again, uh, complicates things in, in our model. And finally, this is probably the most interesting challenge. You, we, you have to find out whether the fleet of Ubers or taxis or rental cars by the minute or rental bicycles, whether the fleet is big enough and depending on the size of the fleet, what level of service you can deliver with that. So there is a new interaction 
modeling the supply of these services, which we've never done before. And it's, it's very challenging. When I say we've never done before, obviously there are examples in which this has been done and I will show you one of them. Um, but in, in more generic terms, we haven't, we haven't done it. And finally, we need to generate some new key performance indicators, not just the flows and delays, but the emissions, uh, the fleet efficiency usage that, you, that you're getting, how better off or worse off is the city or on different sections of the community within a city by gender, by socioeconomic group and so on. So let's have a look at what happens with mobility as a service. Uh, the vehicle kilometers travel will change and they will change essentially for because of the way they are served, but also because you have empty vehicle kilometer travels. I mean, you have relocation of vehicles to serve other customers. This happened with taxis as well. With taxis, we also, I mean, there is a driver there, but there are no passengers. And so we have these extra vehicle kilometers travel and they increase congestion and they increase emissions. And in the terms of the level of service, we're interested in the perceived marginal cost of using a particular mode, because that perceived mar marginal cost of using your own car is very low. You only perceive fuel costs and a little bit more, where if you're using Uber or Lyft, you have to pay for the whole thing, including the driver. Now, the driver disappears with connected and autonomous vehicles, and that's a challenge. Cabs will reduce the cost of mobility as a service dramatically. Probably in some places they explain that they will become half of the current cost, and therefore the impact is going to be significantly bigger than it is now. It also will affect the perception of time, especially if you think of, of an autonomous vehicle. Uh, time doesn't matter in the same way as it matters when you're driving or you're a passenger. So the subjective value of time, which is a key element in our models, will actually become less clear cut, more blurred. Um, willingness to share a ride is important, if it's particularly important in times of, of COVID, but we also need to accept waiting diversion times and probably walking times. If we're currently using the car, these will be new costs added to our um, level of service consideration. And the modeling of the supply of the new mobility service is a new challenge and it's a very demanding one. Now, new data sources have already been mentioned and you have um, already displayed some of the usual pictures that when we talk about this, <clears throat> which is very close to my heart, um, we deal with the same things that we have described before, um, mobile phone data, in, uh, apps in mobile phone data, which provide a little bit more um, granularity in location and, uh, and in time, but uh, the risk of bias is important. Smart cards, which are generally used now in Europe to pay for public transport and other things, they provide some very rich data source for public transport users. And uh, the other things, GPS and navigation systems and uh, automatic number plate recognition, videos and sensors that we can put in different places. And, they certainly help us develop and adapt better models faster and also to monitor changing trends, which has become very critical now with, with the impact of COVID. The only thing I would like to say about uh, big data of this kind is that the raw data, the CDR, the call detail records or the GPS coordinates in, a, in an app are not the end product. The end product requires to go through a full process from storage and data management, cleaning and error correction. All this data comes with its own set of errors as household service do. And the analytic modeling and expansion of the sample is, is very critical, precisely as it was mentioned before, to correct the biases that are present in, in this data. And it's generally, it is quite possible to correct most of them. Uh, and then you generate the indicators and you validate the outputs so that they can actually be used. I would only like to highlight here that the algorithms that we use, and I'm sure Elsage and, and Streetlight and Teralytics use very similar ones, uh, all of them start by identifying where people stop 
for how long they stay there and how they move and perform another activity somewhere else. So it's a very natural data source. Actually, in that case, mobile phone data is better than apps data because there's greater continuity in it to have, if you like, an activity-based model because we have the full chain of activities connected by trips. Now, why modeling is difficult? I take an extreme example. This is a, a share ride vehicle. And um, this vehicle, um, let's say you start at home, you summon it, it comes from a depot, comes to you, you take it, but on your way to work, you have to pick up and drop another four passengers. And so you have a diversion of the tour time, the tour distance and the tour time involved. You arrive at work and later on you want to make uh, another trip and you summon another vehicle and so on. So you have several tours and the tourist times involved in this exercise. And these have to be added to our accounting for congestion, our accounting for emissions, our accounting for impacts on different segments of the population. So very recently, about six months ago, I was involved in a relatively modest exercise to try to see how far we could go with the classic trip-based model in order to incorporate these additional times, these additional waiting times, diversion times, uh, and this for um, a country in the Middle East. Uh, and we based this on, on a cube model, actually, sorry, Caliber, it was a cube model in this case. Um, and so we did our best. We tried to see how far we could go in capturing these elements. So for example, we took relationship like the proportion of the total vehicle kilometers, vehicle kilometers star are these the minimum vehicle kilometers travel if you assume that they behave like a private car. So they go directly from origin to destination. But a proportion of those vehicle kilometers travel additional to it has to be for reallocation of the vehicle, of the unit, has to go somewhere else to pick up another passenger, has to go empty to somewhere else to go. And the same for, again, the minimum route and how much you should add in order to account for detours or deviation from, from the trip. And then a calculation about the fleet, how big the fleet needs to be to deliver a particular level of service. And this is also based on the occupancy passengers per unit that you can achieve. So we have a general scheme like this. We start with an estimate from thin air of the level of service that the demand responsive transit will, will offer. And we have the normal cars and scheduled public transport level of service standard there, again, um, an initial value. And then we go to um, choice of mode and destination and uh, an approximate demand responsive transit assignment and the corrections which I mentioned before. Uh, and this results in a fixed flick size. We check whether the flick size is sufficient to deliver the assumed level of service. And if it's not, we increase, for example, waiting time. So we then run the system again with an increased waiting time. This is similar to the arrangement that sometimes we use for um, parking uh, modeling, uh, where you know that there is a fixed number of parking spaces. And as soon as those parking spaces get filled up, your search time in this case, or your waiting time for them increases. And then you have a couple of equations here that uh, you could use in order to represent these. Now we wrote the equations for these, but obviously we lack a lot of the data for it. So at the moment we are not in a position that we can actually calibrate uh, these models. Uh, but we have enough um, confidence that as a first approximation, first cut approximation, we could account for this type of um, new mobility systems, provided they are not uh, a very significant share of total travel, say something around perhaps five, six percent, but no more than that. Then you need to go for something else. And this will be an agent based model. Um, it will be based on a sample of the population, which 
may be obtained from household surveys or from mobile phone data. Mobile phone data is very imperfect compared with the household survey. More likely with the combination of both, you ex expand that sample to the whole of the population and you try to mode, uh, model the, the new systems better. In fact, your agents are, each individual is an agent, but also each vehicle is an agent. Because in fact, the, the tours of vehicles are probably more important than the tours of people in this type of model. And uh, because there are only a fixed number of vehicles and they have to provide service for everybody. Um, and um, this requires as well um, a, a logistic modeling. How do you optimize the allocation of vehicles to people? And in a sense, a dispatcher, somebody who decides is, is an algorithm, of course. We will use this vehicle to attend this guy because he is going in a direction similar to these two other people, which en route they may be picked up and delivered as well. And this is a much more complicated exercise. But the International Transport Forum has done four large scale exercises modeling this type of surveys using an agent-based model, and you can visit their models in, in, in this link, which I provided there. Lisbon, Dublin, Auckland, Helsinki were the, the cities, and, and they found some interesting results from, from that exercise. They're, they're not used for planning at this stage, but these are used for um, experimentation. And we are at Norman, we were involved with PTV, another company, which is not Caliper, I'm sorry, uh, when they were trying to test their um, mobility as a service modules, which they have now and they market as well. And then we use, in that case, this is a model of Barcelona in Spain. Uh, we use the mobility uh, data from mobile phones data, and they added a mass modeler, which is their unit, uh, creating the synthetic population, creating requests for these services and allocating um, supply of vehicles to attend those services. Now, PTV was in a particularly good position, as it is Caliper, actually, because they have logistic models in, this, in their packages. So they could extend the logistic modeling to attend this type of exercise. And they produce the traditional output of all the routes that have been followed and the KPIs for level of service fleet usage and so on. So this is my last slide, I finish here. And the classic four stage model allows only very coarse approximation to model this new mobility system. It is possible, I think, but I guess this is just intuition rather than uh, strict science. That is a market share is above five, six percent. You really need to go for a, a, an agent-based model, which are new, uh, which is not an activity-based model. I mean, although an activity-based model may be used to generate this this model, um, and um, you need to represent and model both the supply and the demand more realistically, and, and this is required. This requires generating a synthetic, a better synthetic population than just from a small household survey. So you're more likely you need to combine it with mobile phone data or smart card data and other data sources. And now we are having a, a, a new interesting problem that a few MPOs are starting to consider, which is the optimal combination. Because if you are using a lot of mobile phone data, uh, LBS data, you don't need to collect such a big sample for the household survey because you are extracting from the household survey some of the particular type of information that you're never going to get from uh, mobile phone data. For example, whether the person, whether there is a car in the household, two cars, three cars, um, is there a scooter, a bicycle? That type of information doesn't exist in, in mobile phone data and it will not exist for a very long time. So these are the problems which I consider we are facing, one of the four big challenges that we're facing. And I will welcome questions and challenges to my statement. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. I also, virtual, virtual applause. Thank you for the presentation, it was really great. And I, 
I like that you end on the four challenges uh, and, and uh, hopefully we can open this up to, to some questions and discussion and have people unmute and turn their cameras on and, and, and start to, to, to maybe answer some of these, at least provide some feedback. Have I released my screen? And not yet. I can uh, help you with that, though. Let's see everybody. Let me see if I can make it in gallery mode. So in the LinkedIn event, one of the questions that uh, I posed was, what is the biggest model development challenge? And we had about 15 votes. The two popular ones was access to data and technical skill. And I think uh, we've, we've touched on this a little bit is, is access to data. Uh, I, I know from, from our experience at Systematica at least, this is always where we're, we're starting is, is for no matter where we're working, what, what are the data sources available? Uh, to us and, and what's at least now with, with some of the private side, what's the cost associated with this? I think uh, maybe others can comment on this as well, but uh, the access to data I see as being uh, increasingly challenging. If, if I may say something, um, sure. I don't think that's true. Um, the, um, there is a lot more data now floating around. I mean, with our mobile phones and, and our navigation systems in our cars, we are creating a lot of digital traces. Um, um, Europe is full of cameras as well, and I would imagine the US is, is too. Um, it's a matter of processing that and processing that well. It, it will not replace a small sample household serving that that I think we still need um, for a while. Although there are little apps now that you can use. Xing is one that was developed at MIT, which I have been using, um, which enable to replace the, the, the paper household survey with an app in, in your smartphone. And they would sort of work 80, 85 percent of the time. Well, the other 15 percent of the time they don't. But so do household surveys with paper. I mean, people refuse to, to open the door to you. They lie to you. They say that they only went to work and came back, or they just simply say, no, I didn't travel at all on the travel day um, because they are fed up of answering questionnaires. I mean, we are invaded by questionnaires. And I, I think that's one of the reasons we generate so much data that we're very resistant now to answer yet another, another questionnaire. But, but this data is becoming increasingly available. It's, it's, a, it's cheaper than household survey or intercept surveys. Um, it takes time, but that's my experience. Lita, I was actually gonna encourage you um, to talk about how you are kind of removing the privacy data from your household survey uh, in an attempt to make it more publicly available. Because my thinking was, there's a lot more data available out there. It all costs money. Um, mm -hmm. And if you're a large agency, that's really not a big deal. Um, but if you're a smaller agency, or even if you're just a student in the field and you want to like, test building some like basic econometric models, uh, we don't really have that kind of MNIST open data set that we can all like use and compare. Uh, so, so Ida, I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about what you were doing. Um, thank you, Kyle. And then I'll also note that we've got a hand up. And then if I've got time, I want to circle back around the workforce development, which I guess was in the running for data. Um, but yeah, I think especially being at a research institute, um, you know, housing the triangle regional model, we are trying to move towards more towards open source, uh, both open source for our model and our code, um, and open source for our data once we you know, strip off any of the information that would make that data sensitive um, with this theory that, you know, we can all benefit from that. Um, you know, whether you're a student trying to work on a master's project and you need access to data to support your learning and development, or whether you're a small agency that can't afford to collect your own survey data and perhaps you want to try to 
um, combine data sources from uh, regions that are you know, have some similarities to yours uh, and use that to inform your process. So yeah, this is something that, um, that you know, again, I think being at a research institute, we feel like it should be part of our mission. Uh, so much money is invested in data and in our model development process. And I personally feel like we're not fully getting the benefit of that investment if we don't make it more widely available to others. So I, I recognize that I'm not sure how to say your name, Rawad. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and then I, I've got a comment if we have time, I want to circle back around to, to sort of that element of the challenge of the workforce. Yeah, yeah, just a quick question. First, thanks, thanks everyone to, to the wonderful presentation. Um, I, I have a question for Luis. Actually, you, you mentioned something interesting when you talked about taxis. Uh, you, they don't have a passenger, but they're the driver on, and they risk just moving. I know there are lots of cities where taxis can also just move in the city looking for passengers. This is something in Milan, for instance, we don't have it. They have to stop somewhere, and then they are either cold or you have to go to the station. Um, I'm just wondering, while modeling uh, MAAS or modeling AVs or modeling, did you, did you start quantifying the inefficiencies or the efficiencies that these systems bring to the city? No, we don't. Uh, we didn't. Um, and um, this is a very interesting question because I'm not sure the system in Milan is efficient. I don't think it's very efficient for the taxi drivers, but it's not efficient for the customers. And you have to consider both. I mean, the taxi driver and, and the emissions are, are reduced. That's true. But people have to walk more um, in order to get them. Uh, and that's an inefficiency where the floating system um, is, first of all, is more competitive which is neither good or bad. I mean, it's more competitive, that's all. Uh, but it needs a clever driver to guess where the demand is going to evolve at different times of the day and, and so on. And they do. They, if you ask a question, they, they describe their thinking on how the demand evolves in, in London or in Santiago or in Abu Dhabi, which is the case of, I, I mentioned before. Um, so I'm not sure about the measure of efficiency that you are having in mind. I think you have in mind a measure of efficiency of reducing uh, empty vehicle kilometers. Yes, they are. They're not zero because they still have to come back to their base. They deliver somebody somewhere and they have to choose a particular base. I mean, what is efficient is, is Uber. Uber is efficient because you summon it with an app. It may be floating but it's, it's there available to the nearest to you and you take that one. So that's a much more efficient system than having taxis on, on fixed locations. Um, and, and that's why Uber is very successful. Um, I mean, one of the reasons why it's very successful, not the only one. I think the integration of the whole service in an app is a very clever thing, which incidentally, as transport planners, we should have guessed that it was going to happen. And it's very, it's actually a shame that we didn't. And when it happened, we were caught on by surprise. This is very embarrassing for our profession. And we developed, started thinking about policies, how to deal, deal with Uber about two years after they happened. And, and it shouldn't have happened like that. And, and we're now still being surprised by electric scooters as well. I mean, at least in Europe, we don't know really what to do. Are they legal? Are they not legal? Where they can drive on the pavement or on the on the sidewalk? What what do we do with them? Uh, interest. So there must be a measure of efficiency um, produced by the model, which is ideally similar to the efficiency on the ground, very closely associated with that. But the efficiency has its three dimensions. It's efficiency for the user, efficiency for the operator, and efficiency for the city. And these are three different types of uh, efficiency, which you have to bear in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, so there was a question in the chat that I would love to hear people uh, Yeah, it was a bit long. Uh, way in on. <laughs> I, I, I'm so, Latin American. I'm, I'm Chilean, <laughs> so I, I, I cannot be succinct. 
it's, it's difficult. Kevin, do you um, want to unmute yourself and turn your camera on, or, or do you would you like me to read it? I know you're not shy, Kevin. Maybe today I am. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw out that controversial question. Has, uh, has the shine come off activity-based models with the advent of big data and all the potential possibilities there? And, and my applaud to everybody presenting today. They did a wonderful job. Thank you. Well, I don't know, as, as, as you can start with me, uh, as you probably know, Europe uh, has been very slow moving in adopting activity-based models, and there are only a handful of them. And none of them, no, no decision has been made on any of them, based on any activity-based model. So again, if we're talking about efficiency, that's a very expensive thing to do for nothing, because no decision has been based on this activity-based model. Papers have been written, uh, policies are being suggested, but no decisions are being made um, for, for the reasons that you, you, you probably understand. And I think the, the approach that um, the, the Kylie presented here that, and, and Lita as well, that you have known deficiencies in your model that you want to address. And what is the best way of addressing them is, is the right one, rather than okay, somebody, activity-based models are intuitively, they're perfect. They explain very well what, how, why people travel and how they travel. They also have the built-in assumption that we do the same things depending on the type of person today, tomorrow, and 10 and 20 years time. When we know that this is not true, and we know not just because of COVID, but we know that we change our activities, we change our values, and we change our priorities. So it's, it's a very significant effort, very rational effort, if you like, but I'm not sure it necessarily helps you making much better decisions in, in practice. And that's why the process of being slow, tentative, experimental, the university is leading this, um, and, um, and we, we may get there. I think, one of the things I try to say in my presentation is that because of if these new mobility systems really take off and become important, we will have to do something like an activity based model. We have no choice. So uh, Europeans will be taken kicking and screaming to use an agent based model. It may not be based on activities in the sense that you could change or you can negotiate your activities within the household and postpone something for the weekend rather than doing it today. That's a rich activity modeling. Most activity-based models are not that rich in, in behavioral terms and the, the activities are rather fixed. Um, but uh, you will, we will need to model these agents, the vehicles, the dispatchers and the customers in a new way if we're really going ahead with that. Which I think we will, and it's a matter of Time. Yeah, I, I have a follow-up question to the same theme, if I, if I may. Um, there are no other volunteers. So, with, yeah. with, with the point you just made, I feel like we're on the cusp of transformative technology impacts on our mobility. Yeah. Why are we producing 2050 forecasts right now? to support the MTP <laughs> and, and so who is going to lead the way, who is going to lead the way? Uh, I know in the United States, it's, it's a FHWA requirement, but it seems to me like we should be going more toward 10 or 15 year horizons instead of 25, 30 year horizons. So I'll jump on this one again. When we oh, risk and uncertainty. I'm sorry, I've got a, we talked about this, but do we really do it? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so ahead, this Kyle. is uh, similar to, to your first question. I, I think one of the problems with activity-based models is they're so expensive and they take so long to develop. Um, and uh, what would seem wiser, given that most, you know, a lot of people are on like five-year rotations of when they need new plans and things like that, is to have perhaps a simpler modeling system, but we update it all the time, right? Yep. So 
um, and I, I mentioned that kind of ensemble approach, uh, you know, you if, if we get really good and fast at, at building um, kind of uh, just a suite of models, right, that are simpler and, and don't take a million dollars and five years to deliver, uh, we might actually get better guesses. Um, but yes, I have, so I actually started off, my first five years uh, was at the capital area NPO that Lita put up on the map. And, and I went through two long range planning uh, processes as like a half planner, half modeler. And at the end of the second one, well, really the end of the first one, I just remember thinking, why am I guessing 30 years in the future um, when everyone, like the first thing you learn is like, you know, we, you know, Louise talked about, we missed Uber. Well, you know, we also missed women entering the workforce and we missed like other like major things. And it seems like, you know, putting one to $5 million uh, to, to, to build a model that's likely going to not be valid, you know, five years down the road, it doesn't seem like a good use of public funds. Yeah, you know, I, I read, uh, it's probably true that children born today will not know what a steering wheel is because the steering wheel will not exist in vehicles by the time they get to be drivers. And, um, <laughs> you know, and I, I, I just wonder to your point, Kyle, like, I feel like the industry should be going more toward like a quick response model. I, I joke around that we're going back in time because my, my colleague was a, was a trailblazer on the gravity model in the 60s, but what did they do in the 60s? For gravity, they OD matrix estimation in the base year and they freight tar targets in the forecast. And right, I, I yeah. feel like we're going, we're all uh, <laughs> Marty McFly and back to the future here, you know? Um, well, so what I will tell you is I, I don't have a newborn, but I have a three-year-old and he's getting my beat up old car off the steering wheel when he's first driving. I don't care how many uh, automated vehicles there are. Yeah, yeah. But anyway. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I take your point. But, but you get the point, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, and, and I have to say that TechStots, they've got that point, you know, like even with a traditional, you know, trip-based model, like you said, it takes a million dollars with the surveys and counts and you know, in a few years to calibrate, you know, if we've got this rich data, base year data and study areas not growing that much, could we apply some sort of simpler method to, you know, do something yeah. 10 or 15 years from now? I know that Vince talks a lot about uh, pivot models where he basically like bases the model on the observed base year data. And then instead of going through like all these convolutions and equations, you just simply, um, kind of perturb or pivot off of that base data and kind of adjust it based on land use or a few other things. Um, yep. But that's a model that you can throw up in, I don't know, a few months maybe or something like that. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's pretty agile. Yeah. Maybe we can ask uh, Lita, you, I mean, since you're going through this new model development process, I mean, you have stakeholders and I'm sure you had to answer why we need this new model and you talked about how it was a piecemeal, but once it's done, and what are what are some of the, I guess the planning questions that you're hoping that the new model will be able to assist with in an area as you mentioned is number two in the region. I mean, if we think about theoretically where models came from and and in kind of front of the MPO level, mainly uh, for for highway building, but but no longer are we doing this. We have to start thinking of other planning, and they've since evolved. What are some of the goals that you are hoping that will be able to, to come out of, I guess, the new model development process? Well, I think um, one of my personal goals is to convince my sponsors that the model can't do everything for them, um, that that's not it's what it's designed for, that uh, sometimes we can take the data that come out of them and use it in different ways to tell, help inform stuff. But, I, um, I do worry a little bit, to be honest, that they know they're getting this new generation model and that they have this expectation that it can do everything. And it can't, it's one of the tools in our toolbox. Um, some of the, the concerns that we hope the new model is gonna be better at is, um, I mentioned this in my last slide, is that is, is, is using the data that comes out of the model in a more disaggregate way 
to try and better inform decision making because we're a huge region. And um, one of the things that we're really looking to do is invest a lot more in transit and transit alternatives. The old model had a very limited no choice structure, so we couldn't test a wide array uh, of, of different types of modes. We're going to be able to do that with the new model, but that's not sufficient. We've got to be able to drill down and understand really what the mode shares mean in a subregion instead of, you know, just at a region. And that's just kind of simple education, I think, and, and messaging you know, how we get that data out of there. And then I think you know, probably all of us um, are seeing the uh, increasing interest in equity and um, wanting to understand how um, equity is taken into consideration for project prioritization or, you know, the projects that do end up in our long range transportation plans. And so we feel like that some of the disaggregate elements of our new model are gonna give us a, a better opportunity uh, to understand some of those components. Mm -hmm. the, the second question I asked uh, in the, was about the COVID-19 lockdowns. I, I, I know we're probably all tired of hearing this, but I think uh, one of the things is we've really saw an impact to many of the transportation systems. If you follow New York, I mean, they were like pennies away from full bankruptcy and and I Louise you mentioned some of the your four challenges and you mentioned uncertainty and I wondered if that with that uncertainty you had this in mind of like uncertainty with with uh, climate changes does that natural disasters other pandemics I mean uh, these sorts of things I mean do we need to be considering this in modeling and uh, is that what you meant when you said uncertainty or, or was that something you had else you had in mind Oh, indeed, yes. Um, I mean, I think at the moment, consideration about uncertainty in Europe and in, in the UK in particular is more important than consideration about these new um, technologies. And um, we have considered, I mean, every investment is uncertain. I mean, if we look at the private sector, you, you want to buy a house, your own, and there is uncertainty about it. You get a survey, you get everything fine, but suddenly next door comes a, a, a hard rock band and, 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 and the noise is unbearable and, and you never plan for that. So every investment has, has risks um, and involves uncertainty. And, and there's nothing new about that. So the question is, how do we use our models to advise on decision-making and the uncertainty? The fact that we know that whatever projection we do is going to be wrong. We know that it's going, the only thing certain about the projection and it is, is wrong, it's not going to happen. Something else will happen. So the, the current trend is to look at scenarios, to look at different scenarios. Um, the, again, scenario analysis, scenario planning is a very old technique developed in the private sector and the, the military. The military are very keen on using scenario planning as well. Um, but it's relatively new for us, for, for the transport field. And, but uh, in the last four or five years, New Zealand, the UK, uh, are actually worked quite hard at developing plausible scenarios, which will serve as a sort of standard scenarios to build a local scenario. Sen local scenarios will be different because they will be more uh, domestic in, in a sense, but the broad scenarios, and now the UK has, the core scenarios available for you to consider when dealing with that. Um, but then you have, say, six projections, one for each scenario, um, which, which, how do you use that? I mean, what do you make with that? You bet one scenario against another, what, what do you do? So there is a problem, which is also relatively new, is how do we use this information for helping make making better decisions. And this actually affects cost-benefit analysis and because cost-benefit analysis in a sense assumes a single future, no more than one future available, a single future. And then you get your beautiful benefit cost ratio which says everything is fine, decision maker, you can go ahead, nobody is going to blame you for this, which is what the decision maker wants. It wants safety, it wants to be sure that it will not be accused of corruption or, or, or having pet projects and, and chasing just pet projects rather than uh, 
something solid supported by science. Um, so we need to review uh, cost benefit analysis, decision making uh, technologies in, in a sense, uh, to adapt to, to that. And in doing so, we will have another dimension, which again, occasionally we looked at, but we should look at it more frequently now, which is the adaptability of schemes, whether whether the scheme is adaptable, whether you can you can do something with it if, if conditions change in such a way uh, that the project is no longer viable anymore. It's, it's, and, and you can use big data to track these changes in trends. Um, so adaptability costs money, it's not free, um, but you have advantages if you adopt it. So there is another cost benefit analysis there that you have an additional expenditure in your scheme you buy a bit more land than you needed originally, uh, but you, you can then expand this or, or you can build a, the typical example that everybody mentioned is, is the, uh, the bridge in Lisbon um, that was built with better foundations so that they can put a railway underneath later on. And they did, but at the beginning it was not necessary to have a railway link there. And they did and it was very successful. So uh, this, new dimensions have to come into our decision-making processes now. And uh, I don't have the solution, but I, I know that we need to do it. I think the only solution is having good leadership in, in, in that decision-making. It, it, it helps a lot. It helps a lot, actually. And if you look at big successful projects in the world, all of them are associated with good leadership rather than a good model. I have to say. Yeah, very true. So I want to open it up to anybody else that has any other questions, because I think we're nearing the end of our, our session for today. And if not, I want to thank everybody for taking the time. I know here in Europe it's late. Uh, you, we've kept you guys on the East Coast away from lunch, uh, but hopefully this was enough to, to hold your appetite. So if not, then uh, go ahead. I just want to circle back around and just make this one comment that, you know, as I'm listening to the presentations today and, and recognizing that I, I feel like in a lot of ways, the, the skills um, that one needs to go into travel forecasting, travel models, systems analysis, whatever, data analytics, data science are so much different from the workforce of yesteryear, like when I started my career. And I think it's getting harder and harder to find folks, um, especially in the areas that we often go looking um, for our folks that are gonna have this skill set that take us to that next level. And I feel like that this is something that all of us as an industry should be um, paying attention to. And, and maybe especially those of us in academia is how do we um, you know, train that next generation of workforce? I mean, how do we recruit them and how do we retain them when the competition has gotten so much greater, you know, I, I used to like to say when I was in consulting, we're not competing with other engineering consulting firms for our talent. We're, we're competing with, you know, a lot of other different types of companies, which used to not be the case. Um, so that might be a, a good topic. I don't know if that's the venue that y'all typically cover, but I feel like it's important for all of us to be talking about. No, it's a great point, Lita. I think I think the modeling community is is small. I mean, there's a lot of familiar faces in here. We we invited people in modeling, and and uh, I think you're right. I mean, the skill set was also part of that uh, that that question that I posed. And you know, access to data and technical skill, technical skills were the two that were chosen. Uh, so so we know our challenges and keeping the technical skills. I mean where they need to be, you know, with hopefully with the help of, of Caliper and PTV and City Labs and attending those trading is at least getting the younger generation at least interested in this is, is gonna be, I guess, on, uh, on those in more senior positions, perhaps. <laughs> um, there's one question in the, the chat. Uh, do traffic forecasts and models only account for include adults or do they account for children? answer this but i'll let uh, some of the panelists answer this in general they only account for children if they are accompanied by an adult um that i mean defining children as 
up to 10 or something like that. Yeah. That's the truth. Yeah. So, yeah, like a lot I'm not of saying this is correct, but this is what happened. Yeah, yeah so, so like in an activity based model, children can drive mandatory tour types. Like, you know, you have to take them to school or you have to, you have to do something. Yeah. Um, in one of the ABMs that we've built, uh, you know, you have to reserve a car to take them to school. So there's uh, household car management um, and kids play a, a huge role in that. In fact, even more so than the primary worker, kids get first dibs on whatever cars you have. So uh, yeah, it depends on the model type, but pretty much every model will model them somehow. Yeah, and at least also in household size, if they use that as a, a input. Yeah. Okay, I think that that wraps it up for today. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists for joining and presenting is very much appreciated. And thanks for, for everybody who attended. And like I mentioned, we'll send out a, it's being recorded. So we'll send out the recording and we'll attach uh, some slides and contact information for questions that are already. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Very, very stimulating. Thank you. Take care, have a nice night. Yes.